Marnen! Marnen! Welcome to the India Explained podcast, recorded in London and San Francisco. One take, unscripted, no rehearsal. Yeah. Hey, Banti. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, hope everything is tip top in London. Uh, and, uh, you know, I believe it's. Uh, is it hot there? Quick question. <laughs> It is. It is. I think it's uh, getting to be a bit muggy. But I think you've picked up. You sent an interesting story to me, uh, Rohit, which is about a freezer, which freezes things up. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about the story? Right, right. And that's exactly why I was asking whether it was hot there. So you know, if it's hot, it's the kind of day where uh, you know someone who may be dead, uh, <laughs> but uh, people don't want to cremate or bury them, should probably be kept in a freezer. And I say this because the story that's popped up on my news feed yeah. two days ago, BBC News. Ashutosh Maharaj, followers win fight yeah. to keep Guru in freezer. So the backstory to this yeah. is that there's this Maharaj slash Baba, founder of the sect, yeah. Divya Jyoti Jagriti Sansthan, which means the Divine Light Awakening right. Mission. He apparently died of a heart attack in Jan 2014. But his followers insisting he is only meditating deeply and will one day return to life. Achha. They have kept his body in a commercial freezer. This commercial freezer is filed at his vast ashram in Punjab. So the judgment by the Punjab and Haryana High Court ends a three-year-old dispute between the Guru's disciple and a dude called Dalip Kumar Jha, who claims to be his son. So the son said, look, right. I need to like cremate him in line with Hindu rituals. And the court yeah. uh, you know, rejected his plea. Uh, 2014 judgment was that he is clinically dead, uh, so you can go ahead with cremation. And uh, now there is some complication where the lawyers are saying that, uh, uh, you know, where apparently it's not very clear that the person, the earlier judgment was not clear whether he's alive or dead. Uh, so this is the background to the story. But this sect, like many of these cults, it's made massive money, attracted millions of followers, founded in '83. Uh, right. pro- properties worth $120 million in the US, South America, India, Australia, Middle East, Europe, etc. So yeah, why don't you take it from here, man? I think the guy has a, you know, it's a sophisticated operation, Roy. It's not a yeah. Mickey Mouse operation. This guy is running a business empire and he has an official spokesperson, Swami Vishalanand. Huh. Huh. Okay. Vishalanand ends the story by the BBC saying that this guy is, and I quote, he's not dead. <laughs> medical no that's pressing the medical he's not dead medical science does not understand things like yogic science right mm-hmm. so there's another realm of science there's medical science there's yogic science right mm-hmm. and then he goes on to say we will wait and watch right <laughs> we we are confident that he will come back now there is at the, this paragraph of information is fine on so many levels to me yeah. first of all the blind assertion that three years down the line, this guy is not dead, mm. right? The the positioning of an alternative set of science, uh, mm. almost like alternating facts, like, you know, there's medical science, there's yogic science, mm. right? And then kind of encouraging the followers that we will wait and watch, mm. and we are confident. But, you know, there's this guy, that I'm going to segue into somebody called Tariq Aziz, who was Saddam Hussein's uh, <laughs> defense minister. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? This guy was a weird one because uh-huh. this this sect reminds me of that Tariq Aziz. Uh-huh. So the American invasion was in progress. Uh-huh. Uh, and on news channels, you were getting coverage that American troops were pretty much having chewing gum in central Baghdad. Uh-huh. Tariq Aziz was holed up in the air fort uh-huh. huh, saying things like, I have every confidence that the foreigners will be going home crying today. Ah, like, and and he, really... <laughs> you would think like oddball thing. Like, you know, it's just like it disproportionate like, to reality. Know. And this was also like what he would do is like first statement was there are no Americans in Baghdad and another American tank in the background as he's speaking. Next statement correct, is correct. first is there is no American in Baghdad. Second one is that I will teach the Americans in Baghdad a lesson. So yeah, like, they will go home with their tails behind the leg. Yeah. So that that Tariq Aziz reminds me. This guy reminds me of Tariq Aziz. But but you also have to understand people like yeah. Tariq Aziz and this Swami Vishalanand. You know, I'm pronouncing his name. So they are part of a mechanism which has been briefed. So I I think deep down Tariq Aziz knew he was screwed. Right. Yeah. But. He he couldn't just come out and say it. in this day and age with the kind of sophisticated media apparatus that is there, he couldn't have sustained that kind of kind of lie because people would have kind of shown him evidence of citizen journalism and he would have been uh, chakast. Mm. 
this guy reminded me of Tarek Aziz. But I think the most serious point to make on, on this is uh, there's a prevalence of Babas and Babajis uh, uh, across uh, the Indian firmament. And I think my mind is drawn to a movie uh, with which came out, I think, in the early 70s. Uh, it's it's a unique thing, Rohit, um, because Hinduism is such a flexible thing that people can come in and make it their own in their own special way. Mm-hmm. And I'm drawing attention to a movie called Jai Santoshi Ma, mm-hmm. or Jai Santoshi Mata, something like that. Mm-hmm. And the whole premise of the movie, the movie set in motion... The goddess herself. A cult. Ah. The goddess Santoshi Ma. So... And I was thinking that, it's, and because, you know, obviously you sit closer to this type of analysis than I do, it's very interesting to see that how, uh, to its credit, you know, in any other faith, like, so Monty Python couldn't become another kind of uh, disciple of Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. a, a movie that was made. There couldn't be a Monty Python cult of church, right? Mm-hmm. But if Hinduism gives you the freedom to, uh, you know, adapt at will. Uh, sometimes that adaptation is good and benign. Uh, because I've got nothing against people who follow Santoshi Mata, because you know if it does well for them, it does well for them. Who are we to comment? But at the same time, there's a risk that you know some people use uh, Hinduism and uh, the kind of liberties that it gives to people practicing that faith to their advantage. And this guy in Punjab with his like uh, money and dead body is a prime example. It reeks of not only I reeks is a wrong word. I won't use it, but it's it's a tricky situation. What do you think? No, I <clears throat> completely agree with you. And I think, you know, I'd be a little more skeptical. I know that there's, you know, in, in academia, there's this very interesting kind of backlash against, uh, you know, what is considered to be the rationalist, secular, Nehruvian scientific outlook. And the argument goes that, uh, you know, that perspective comes from a certain embarrassment about our own religiosity. And, you know, we've been trying to overcompensate because uh, Indians were always seen as a people who were excessively religious, etc. Um, so therefore, we must, you know, actually seek some, you know, deep kind of understanding in what's happening with people, uh, uh, you know, uh, flocking omas to these gurus and so on and so forth. So, so the the point I want to make is like I I agree with you completely that if you know Santoshima or any other guru or person works for someone, it's it's sort of up to them. Uh, but you know, when you look at the record of these godmen, so many of them turn out to either be you know molesters, uh, guilty of uh, assault or accused of assault, like Baba Asaram and so on, uh, Bapu Asaram. The the question that arises is why are we as a people drawn in such large numbers to these kinds of figures uh, and also these babas whether it's this sri sri ravi shankar who you know shankar who does some breathing stuff baba ramdev this dude the kind of wealth they amass is just mind boggling so right. uh, <clears throat> you know to me the you know one interesting thing there is that people have massive resources which they give to these people these guys are you know either they're charismatic leaders uh, they somehow they and their followers manage to convince the you know people who donate to them that there is some benefit to be gained. Even Asaram or Ramdev has you know followers all over the world. So what's happening is that in the Indian context, I think that a certain kind of assurance that the state was supposed to provide has clearly failed. Uh, and I think that's where these people have stepped in. And uh, you know the people who follow them are not the poorest. So even for people who are you know middle class, upper middle class, and wealthy. Uh, something right. about modernity, Indian modernity or post-colonial modernity or whatever you want to call it, has has uh, is lacking, which is why you know I think they take to these babas because I don't think these guys are these traditional sort of uh, you know religious figures. These these are very these are very much a kind of modern invention. So that would be my sort of you know quick quick take on this. Chika, I hope the body gets uh, defrosted. And uh, the son can move on and get on with the rest of his life. And uh, all the best to and the Baba's disciples disperse and get on with the rest of their lives, I guess. Yeah, and hopefully Chalo, some of that money goes to, like, you know, the, the people who, who could really benefit. Yeah. All right, man. Take true, care. True. Yeah. Chat. Chalo, take Bye. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.